trained as a Western scientist, I came to feel that the worldview I was taught was too narrow, like a suit one had outgrown, and was searching for what the broader context for a Western science would be. And I've been working on that now for quite a few decades, and have come to the view that consciousness is not a late emergent product of a material evolution, but the exact opposite, the source of all material evolution. So I've come to believe that spirituality and science were separated only for historic reasons, and that it's time now to reunite them in a single worldview that can encompass the best of our spiritual traditions and the best of our scientific traditions. When you do that, as a biologist, as I am, uh, you come to a view of a living universe rather than this strange concept among human cultures that Western science came to, that we're an, in a non-living universe, a mechanical, celestial mechanics, if you like, that's running down by entropy and in which, by some miracle, life emerged from non-life, consciousness from non-consciousness, intelligence from non-intelligence, and those have been the stickiest problems for Western science. And while many Western scientists have convinced themselves that there really are explanations for uh, chemistry coming out of non-life and producing life, I did not find that satisfying. We have a new definition of life in biology in the last few decades called autopoiesis, which means a living entity is one that continually creates itself. This is very unlike a machine, which is created from the outside by an inventor, given its rules of operation, and usually in a hierarchic arrangement, and has to be reinvented to have generations of technology rather than being able to reinvent itself in an evolutionary trajectory. So when I looked at that definition, autopoiesis, I said, well, what's the simplest entity I can think of that continually creates itself? And what I came to was a whirlpool in water. It holds a form through a constant intake of new water and lets out what it no longer needs. Very like a human body, we eat food, we drink water, we breathe in air, we continually renew all our molecules, cells, organs, and we hold a recognizable form through that process, letting go what we no longer need. So I began to see a continuity between the vortex form in protogalactic clouds all over our cosmos, the galaxy that we ourselves live in, the self-creation of Earth over time, which was initially a stardust ball of, of heavier elements, and then cooling on the outside, magma inside, began to turn itself inside out, magma coming through to the surface, then crustal plates forming and, and melting again into the magma as they move and shift. And if you could see a picture of Earth in uh, a few hours, as it's been from the beginning, you'd have no doubt that this is a living entity constantly changing and recreating itself and evolving ever more complexities. Three quarters of its life was devoted just to microbial life, and then the big multi-celled creatures came in. The Earth itself is like a giant cell. Even redwoods have just a thin skin of what we call biological life on its surface. The rest of it isn't alive by our definition, and yet we think of the whole tree as alive. So the planet with its thin skin of biological activity also seems to be a self-creating kind of cell. So looking at its evolution over time, I came to ask the questions of who are we humans in this context? Where did we come from? Where are we headed? What's going on for us now? And the obvious thing about humanity today is that we're in a huge crisis, that we've created enormous crises in economics, in politics, in spirituality, in just about every area of human life, besides destroying our ecosystems in the, in the process of developing our technologies. 
So we're asking ourselves now, where do we go from here? How do we solve this? We've got global warming, we've got pollution, we're sharing it all over the globe. Our boundaries, our political boundaries don't keep it away from each other. We have to develop global family. We have to engage in this process of globalization. So that's our evolutionary trajectory now, is how do we globalize, meaning what? How do we shift a non-sustainable way of life to a sustainable way of life? If we know something is unsustainable, it means it can't last and we have to reinvent it. So our job now is to see if we get a worldview in which we start with cosmic consciousness because no human has ever had an experience outside of consciousness and then recognize that our direct experience is always now and that reality has to be the sum total of human experience. How do we build a scientific model of that? You see, we can't build an objective model of the world out there. We can only build a model of our experience. And our experience at present is how to get out of crisis. Well, looking at living systems over time, I came to understand that they all go through a cycle that's very like our psychological maturation cycles. We start with a unity, we're undifferentiated, we come into the world new, and then individuation happens. We have many experiences, we branch out in many directions, and humanity, as it diversified and had more and more people, created more and more conflicts, exactly as the early Earth differentiated into bacteria, and then they developed different lifestyles, and they became competitive. They had invented technologies in order to carry out their hostilities. They created enormous problems, including global hunger and global pollution, and had to solve those, eventually by negotiating differences, moving on around the cycle, and working out cooperative schemes that ultimately led the ancient bacteria that ruled for the first half of Earth's life to forming a new kind of cell as a community of different lifestyle bacteria working together. That's the nucleated cell that we're made of, that all these trees are made of, all the beings in the waters are made of. Everything we see around us are made of this wonderful big cooperative cell.